Either God's a, uh, true to his word or he's a liar. I believe he's true to his word. He says in his word, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague, shall any plague, shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, and his angels will lift you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. I just, you know, we might be a little different at this church. We just take God at his word. I said we just take God at his word. If he said, now sometimes, I mean, I had just a little bit of argument with the Lord. I'm like, Lord, you know, you said this. You said this. And I'm standing on it. I'm trusting you to bring the, your word to pass. And he watches, you know what? He likes that. He wants you to put him in remembrance of his word. He wants you to do that. He asks us to do that. Put me in remembrance of my word. Why? Because you're his child if you've accepted Jesus. And he wants to bless you and bring the blessings of the new covenant upon you. I guess I'm, I'm here. I might as well just keep going. I mean, the Bible, you know, people think, well, Jesus took our sins away. That is true. He took our sins, but... In that atonement on the cross, he not only took our sins, it says he bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. Yep. It says he bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases, and with the stripes that were laid on his back, ye were healed. That's what the Bible says. Ye were healed. And see, the church got in a mode of just explaining away everything that they don't see come to pass in the, uh, of the promises of God. Instead of pressing into God and saying, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, instead of pressing in and saying, how come we're not seeing these great miracles and, and these things uh, and these promises come to pass, we started explaining away, well, he's just not doing it anymore. That's all passed away with the apostles. Come on. Not anywhere that will dare to believe God. That not anywhere where we'll take God at his word. And so I want to encourage you. You know, I heard uh, one man say in a presidential debate that this is going to be a dark winter. It's going to be a dark winter. And you know, in the world, it may be a dark winter. But we are children of the light. The Bible says that Jesus, when we accepted Jesus, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness, which is this world, into the kingdom of his dear son. And so, we may be in this world, but we ain't of it. We are not of it. I'm of a different kingdom. And I don't live by worldly principles anymore. I don't live by worldly dictates. I don't live by somebody telling me it's going to be a dark winter. I don't receive that. I don't believe it. I believe that my God meets my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I believe that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. I mean dancing, shouting joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's the kingdom that you belong to. That's the kingdom that we have to give priority to in our lives. Because I'm telling you this, I believe this with all my, I'm going to recap this year uh, where God, the Holy Spirit, has shown us from the beginning. Yeah. From the beginning of this year, what things were going to come on the earth, yeah. but we're to, you know, when you see all these things begin to come to pass on the earth, when you see Jesus in um, Matthew 24, and when he talked about all these things that you're going to see, Wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, famines, 
earthquakes, tsunamis, snowstorms of epic proportion. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, this is an extreme. This was an extreme snowstorm. I've lived in New York pretty much my whole life. I remember maybe one storm like this when I was a kid. I don't remember. There were, there were places in New York that got 48 inches of snow in less than 12 hours. Newark, or Appalachian got 40 inches. You had 40? Who had more than 40? What did you have, Virginia? Newark Valley might take the prize. What did you guys have? 44 in Newark Valley. I live on Powder House Road in the town of Vesto, the highest mountain in Broome County. They don't call it Powder House Road for nothing. <laughs> we usually have more snow. I am telling you, we have, had, we have had four or five inches of snow at my house, and I've drove down to the Vesto Parkway, which is three miles away, and it's green grass. And we only got 31 inches. I'm like, the grace of God. And then I thought to myself, you know, after 30 inches, who's counting anymore? Right? I mean, going over. I watched a snowplow, a gigantic snowplow come down our road. It was going over the top of his plow up onto the cab of his truck. He couldn't see. He was inching along, wiping the snow off. It was incredible. But Jesus said, look, these things are going to come to pass. You're going to see viruses. You're going to see pestilences. You're going to see stuff like this. He said, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, just throw up your hands or turtle over in a corner because, man, it's going to be bad. <laughs> what did he say? He said, look up and rejoice for our redemption draws near. I just read in 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter today, that Jesus is going to come and rescue the church from the judgment that's to come. We're getting closer to that judgment that's going to fall on the earth. These are just the beginning, beginnings of birth pangs. Amen. Jesus told us this would happen. Amen. Did he tell us that to make us all afraid? Like, <laughs> I got 50 years of food stored up in a cave up at my house. <laughs> what was that movie that came out? What was that blast from the, what was that? Yes. Blast from the past or something where the guy goes in a bomb shelter in the 1960s because they think a nuclear war hit and then he doesn't come out to the 2000s and the whole world has changed. Jesus didn't tell us that to make us afraid. He taught us so that we will be more emboldened and to know that our redemption draws nigh. And listen to this. This is what you can take comfort in. His word will be true till the day he catches the church away. I don't care what the world is going through. You don't live according to the world's standards, according to the world's dictates, according to the world's economy. You have a God that his name is El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough, the God that supplies your every need according to his riches up in glory, and he'll take care of you till the day he comes to catch you away. Yes. And you will be a light because people will see that, huh, what's going on with those people? Their needs are met. They're always full of peace and full of joy. We're wringing our hands over here, hiding in one room in our house with 16 air purifiers so that we don't get the coronavirus. I'm not saying you don't need to use wisdom and things in the earth, but God will give you wisdom. You know, I mean... I didn't need our governor to tell me to wash my hands with soap and water. <laughs> I did that anyhow. In fact, I don't know too many people that weren't. Do you know what I mean? And pray for our health care workers because they are on the front lines. You know, Mary Kay, who was here last week, uh, she works in uh, 
she told me. Not Strong Memorial, the other hospital in Rochester. She's had the head of nursing up there. She retired, but because of the COVID, she's been back there three days a week. In fact, she got some award from the city of Rochester just recently for taking care of coronavirus patients, but uh, uh, has a wealth of knowledge about that stuff. And, uh, you know, there, I imagine, you know, I called our plow guy, and I know he went like three days without sleep, but I imagine our health care workers in the hospitals that are on the front lines and in the nursing home, I imagine they feel like those, like they've had a year of what uh, those snow plow drivers are going through right now for three days. It's been like a year. So pray for them, because they are on the front lines, and they, they need our prayers, and they need to be strengthened. They need to be protected. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We know it's a real virus. We're not, nobody has argued that. Anyhow, I better pray before I just keep rambling on. <laughs> Come on, the rambles are pretty good usually. <laughs> Father, we're just so thankful and so grateful for your word. We're so thankful, Father God. So thankful. In the beloved, that we can come boldly to you because of the, our faith in the blood of Jesus. Not because of our own works or our own righteousness, but because of our faith that Jesus has done for us. What am I doing? I think I was bragging and I just got prideful because I was, I've been in a lot of big ministries and I thought we never have any sound problems or any. And the last two weeks, I've heard scratchiness, on the, which we've never had before. Hallelujah. So, Father, before I was interrupted, we thank you and praise you. I pray that you'd give me utterance today that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of this glorious gospel. Pray that your, whatever you need to come out would come out today. And we, I pray that you give us ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts to receive the divine truth impartations and grace deposits you have for us today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Did, did you guys enjoy Mary Kay last week? Yes. I'm telling you what, I was up here, I was next to her. That healing anointing on her was so strong. And uh, I know we've had some people healed because they told me about it. We may have them give testimony later. Uh, but... Uh, I, we got to have her back, and she's going to, you know, she's starting out. Her husband just was tragically killed in September in a head-on collision. He was in the, he was in uh, internal investigations, and in he had retired from it in the Rochester Police Department, and uh, it was just a tragedy. Some young person, uh, the details, that they tried to pass another a truck, and hit him head on with, you know, he had basically no warning when they hit. They just collided head on. And uh, so it was, it was a tremendous tragedy. But to see her, she's carrying on. The family's carrying on. We're so thankful for that. And we're going to have her back. I was thinking about it. So anyhow, if you turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Just going to share a little bit with what God, leave you a little exhortation. Sermon number two, we call it here. But who's counting, right? You come to this church, you know, we, you stop counting after seven sermons, so. <laughs> Second Timothy 3, 14 and 15, and then I'm going to have you after that turn to Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. 19. Everybody there? Cheryl, could you help Frank? <laughs> I'm sorry, Frank. I see he has second he has second Timothy marked and then he's gone. <laughs> they that'll teach you to sit on the front row, I guess, huh? Even your kids are laughing, Frank. <laughs> but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child 
thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Let me just read that again. Again, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen it says, And you shall teach them the laws of God. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by, walk us by the way, when you lie us down, and when you rise us up. You shall teach them to your children. You know, as I said earlier, certainly from a worldly standpoint, 2020 has been wrought with fear, death, and confusion. But thanks be to God as believers, we live in this world. Though we live in this world, we're not of it. Amen? We've had people that got the coronavirus and survived. One man that got it was 77 years old, and he survived. Not only that, he's, he's thriving. Brother Ray, right there, he can hold his hand up. Amen? Hallelujah. And it, so we're so thankful, yeah. But you know, he fills his heart with God's word, and God's word sustained him through it. He only had it for three days. So, well, maybe a little longer, but three days. Is that about right? In the hospital, In the hospital three, three days, and about a week at home. And then fully, fully recovered, right, Ray? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. And we've had others, but we thank God. Everyone, as we just, I said, if you get it, just let us know. We'll pray for you. Believe God to touch you and to heal you. Amen. We thank God for doctors and nurses, but we also thank God for his healing power. So, in Colossians, it says, we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness or this world into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews, listen, the Bible says we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Our kingdom can't be shaken. Oh, pastor, I'm feeling like my life's being shaken. Well, if you feel that way, maybe there's some things in your life that aren't totally founded and built on the kingdom of God. Maybe they need to get shooken off you. That's the way I look at it. If I'm getting shaken by something, I'm like, hold on a second here. Maybe God's trying to teach me something or say, hey, you need to just lay that down. Because that is of the world and it's going to be shaken. I'd rather lay it down than get it shook off me. Have you ever had anything shook off you? You know, my grandma early... I grew up, my grandma early, I just loved grandma early. She got up early. When we would, almost every weekend when I was a little kid, my parents would drive out to Salamanca, New York, and we'd stay at grandma early's house, and I would smell the coffee brewing at 4.30 in the morning. And I'd get up and go down there, and my grandma early would be down there having coffee and smoking a cigarette. And I was her first grand, grandchild. And she would look at me. <laughs> That'll teach you to make fun of my dad, she says. <laughs> Come on, don't make me the bad guy. Cheryl said to her, pastor's looking at you. I was not looking at her. I saw you guys looking at her. <laughs> so anyway, my grandma would smoke a cigarette and, and drink her coffee, and she'd look at me, and she'd say, Derry, she called me Derry, she'd go, Derry, you're going to be the first early to ever graduate, the first one of, my, uh, of our relatives to ever graduate from college, and I'm going to quit smoking so I can be at your college graduation. She never quit smoking. <laughs> I mean, she gave her heart to the Lord. She accepted Jesus down at the uh, PTL club. Jimmy Baker. 
If you remember, some of you young people don't even know that name, but anyhow, she accepted Jesus, but she could never just get rid of that smoking habit. But when I graduated at Syracuse University, she was there sitting in the stands and was able to, uh, you know, her words came true. And she used to tell me I was going to be a preacher. I mean, she was a Catholic. I don't know how. I, I knew I was not going to be a priest. <laughs> I just didn't have that in me. You know, I'm not taking those vows. <laughs> but my grandma early, I mean, there's a few things I remember. She made... I just tell you, she made bologna salad. Don't you wrinkle your nose up. That is my favorite salad. She would take sweet pickles and big, we used to buy bologna in those big chunks. You're too young to remember. Do you remember that? Big, the big chunks. You know when you go to the deli and they slice it? They just cut off a hunk of it and gave it to you. You sliced it at home. And she would get one of those big chunks of bologna and she'd cut it up into pieces, and she had one of those hand grinders that, that, that attached. You'd, you'd screw it onto the edge of the counter. You know what I'm talking about? And she'd put that, she'd take those sweet pickles and that bologna, and I used to love to see it coming out the end. Put it in a thing and mix it with Miracle Whip. Don't, what, you're mayonnaise people, aren't you? Now listen, I've had this discussion, but it says Hellman's, hell men's. I would much rather have a miracle. You know, we can pray for you people and get you, get you converted, get you translated into the kingdom of the miracle whip. But she would make that, I mean, even, I, I think it was, Francine had brought some bologna uh, about five or six months ago, and I'm like, I'm going to take that bologna and grind it up. I took a fork like and just grinded it up as good as I could and mixed some sweet relish that I think Jamie Chafee gave me. and put. I made bologna salad. It still tasted just as good. But my grandmother had one of those washing machines that had a ringer on it. Do you, know what I, do you know what I'm talking about? Had two rollers. And the clothes, you washed it in there, then you just grabbed them, and you, you stuck one in. You did not want to get your finger caught in there. And you stuck it in, and it literally pulled it through those two things, and, and that was the spin cycle. <laughs> it, it ringed all, it rang, whatever, all the water out of that piece of clothes. You dropped it in the bucket, and then went out and hung it on line. I mean, you did not want to get your finger, your hand, or anything. I maybe did once or twice because, you know, it just, it, you're a little kid that it just intrigues you. It does hurt. And Grandma would go, I told you, Derry, not to stick your finger in there. Didn't have a reverse on it either. <laughs> but I'm telling you what. What I'm saying is sometimes we all feel like we've been put through the ringer. But a lot of times, it's just God trying to, because we don't lay stuff down, God has, for our own good, we get it squeezed out of us. Are you listening? I'd much, much rather lay it down. I've been through the ringer a few times. I have been through the ringer. I'd much rather just lay it down than be put through the ringer. Are you listening? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I know it. I'm so happy somebody is. <laughs> Certainly the whole world has felt the birth pangs of 2020, and we were warned that these things would come, not to frighten us, but so that we would fix our gaze on Jesus and so that we would return to our first love. If, so wake up, if 2020 wasn't a wake-up call to a believer, then I don't know what is. Come up here, I got a board I can hit you in the head with. <laughs> this is a wake-up call. Why is it a wake-up call? So we'll get focused on God. 
focused on the things of God, focused on his word, focused on prayer. Amen? So that said, I was thinking about this year and this service, and I could clearly see how the devil used this year to attack the family unit. Well, that's my granddaughter. I knew that cry. Politicians trying to practice medicine have actually told children, grandchildren, to stay away from your parents. Parents of college students have been told, don't let your kids come home for Christmas. They're going to infect you. I'm not judging them, but this isn't about protecting anyone. This is a direct frontal assault of the enemy. And I'm not talking politicians. I'm talking the devil. This is a direct frontal attack of the enemy. En enemy. The devil is attacking the family unit. They want, he wants to dissolve the family unit. Why? Because of the text that I read you. Timothy was taught the scriptures from a youth. The, uh, we're told in Deuteronomy that we should teach our children about the things of God. And in the family unit is the best way, the best place to model, the best place to be an example, the best place to teach your children. I'm just telling you the public schools was not designed to teach your children about God. That is your job, our parents' job, our family unit's job, our grandparents', our great-grandparents' job. And we should model it at home so that our children have seen it and when they grow up, they will not. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Amen. And that is a promise you can stand on and we've stood on it. Amen. She's a sassy little thing. Wonder which one of the parents she takes after. <laughs> you know, the devil knows that the best way the things of God and his kingdom are passed on to our children and their children is through the parents and through the family unit. And he's out to destroy it. Out to destroy it. I'm not going to say that. That said, I believe in godly family traditions. Godly family traditions. My family has a tradition. We play a football game on every Thanksgiving. And I am not saying that it's godly. <laughs> it's a nice tradition, but when... You're 60 years old and your brother is in his late 50s and you're both taking swings at each other. It's not a great tradition. <laughs> I believe in godly family tradition. Oh, brother, traditions are bad. Well, religious traditions can make the word of God of none effect, but godly, trans godly traditions will impart wisdom and reveal the kingdom of God from generation to generation. Jesus had and practiced traditions or customs. Did you know that? Let me read out of Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, as his custom was, Jesus had a tradition or a custom he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. A lot of modern day Christians don't want to hear that. Oh, we don't have to go to church. No, you don't have to. But it should be a good tradition, a good family tradition, a good, a good custom that you are modeling to your family. Amen. Thank you for that one amen. Amen. I know I'm preaching in the choir because on a on you know, few days after Snowvid, you guys have all dug out and you're here. 
And I know we're all tired from it, but thank God you're here. But as he, and he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, Jesus had a custom of going to, the, going to church. I said, Jesus had a custom of going to church. I'm going to keep saying it until everybody says amen. Jesus had a custom of going to church on, Sunday, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. So I want to encourage you, as a family, use this Christmas to continue. Use this Christmas to renew. Use this Christmas to start some new godly family traditions. Use Christmas. It's such a wonderful time. Use Christmas to teach your children about Jesus. To teach them what this season's all about. Use it to start some new traditions.